Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Eric de Kerville. I'm very proud to uh, moderate this uh, Gerbe online symposium. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Gerbe for organizing uh, this event, and I would like to thank the ESGAR for doing an immense effort to make uh, this uh, online symposium possible. It's the first time ever that we do something like this. So thanks a lot. And during this uh, symposium, we will have a uh, uh, two speakers. First speaker is Federica Vernuccio from uh, Italy, University of Palermo, and Vernic Federica is an expert in liver imaging. The second speaker will be Karin Ostwis from uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and she's an expert in bowel imaging. And uh, the last speaker is myself. I come from Paris, and uh, I've been uh, assigned the topic miscellaneous, which, because I'm not an expert in everything, I assume I'm an expert in uh, nothing. And uh, I will uh, not uh, disclose now the topic of our presentation, but you will see at the end of the symposium. And now, without delay, I give the mic to Federica, and you can start your presentation, Federica. Yeah, Eric, thanks for the introduction. I want to thank Gerbe for inviting me for this online symposium, and I want to thank, thank also Esgar for organizing this fantastic online conference. I will show you three cases uh, of the liver, and this is my disclosure. For the first case, we have a 72-year-old woman with a prior history of ovarian light cell tumor almost 20 years ago, and a diagnosis of a granulosa cell tumor of the ovary almost 10 years ago. She was referred to our hospital to review CT images. And specifically, these are the images that they showed us. We can see a pre-contrast image, a portal venous face, and a delayed face. On pre-contrast image, we can see a small hypotenuating lesion similar to a liver cyst. And this lesion does not show any contrast enhancement on portal venous and delayed phase. So here we have a 72-year-old woman with a prior history of ovarian cancer 20 and 10 years ago, and a small hypotenuating liver lesion less than 10 millimeter in size. So my question to you, and I please ask you for all the session, to answer in the chat any of the of this possibility. In this case, A, 0 to 20%, B, 20 to 40%, C, 40 to 60%, D, 80 to 100%. So I will give you now 30 seconds to answer this question in the chat, and then we will see the answers. So for, for all the session, please be ready to answer in the, in the chat provided by Hesgar to answer any of the possibilities of, to our questions. So as we know from the literature, malignancy accounts for 6 to 10% of solitary incidental focal liver lesions in oncologic patients. And granulosa cell tumors have a long natural history with common late relapses. And we also know that hepatic metastases account for only 5 to 6% of all granulosa cell tumor recurrences. So in our case, when I asked you which is the probability of malignancy for this lesion, the answer was A, 0 to 20%, because this possibility is less than 10%. So if we have a small hypotenuating liver lesion in a patient with a prior history of tumor, the possibility that the lesion is malignant is very low. However, this patient underwent a four-month CT follow-up. You can see on the top row the baseline CT images on pre-contrast and portal venous phase. And on the bottom row, the pre-contrast and, and portal venous phase of the four-month CT follow-up. As indicated by the, the arrow, we can see that the lesion has increased in size. And I want to ask you, do you think that this lesion is benign? If yes, please go to the chat and, and answer A. If you don't think this lesion is benign, please go to the chat and write B. I will give you, again, 15 seconds to answer this question.
for this case, we have to know this, that at other levels, the patient had also some new lesions at different levels. And all these lesions were hypotenuating. They were almost similar to a liver cyst, but they were new and they were multiple. And there was the lesion that was increased in size. So for this case, the answer, if this lesion was benign, was no, was, not, was certainly not benign. So we learned from this case two important things. First of all, focal liver lesions discovered incidentally are usually benign. On the other side, granulosa cell tumor has a long natural history with common late relapses. And therefore, in a patient with ovarian cancer, the finding of a single hypotenuating lesion on CT does not always correspond to a liver cyst. Please pay attention to this. And then let's move forward to the sec second case. For the second case, we have a 55-year-old woman with a prior history of breast cancer. The patient was operated and then she underwent chemotherapy. And in 2017, she underwent a follow-up ultrasound. And here are the images of the follow-up ultrasound. As you can see from these images, as indicated by the arrows, we have multiple lesions in these patients. We have multiple hyperechoic lesions with a, an hyperechoic rim. And I want to know from you, if you think that these lesions are benign, go to the chat and write A, yes. If you don't think these lesions are benign, please go to the chat and write B, no. So I will give you 15 seconds. Again, this is a 55-year-old woman, prior history of breast cancer, and multiple focal liver lesions on ultrasound. And we know again that in patients with breast cancer, only 3% of incidental focal liver lesions are, are malignant. So 97% of, of the lesions are benign. However, the presence of multiple hepatic lesions is concerning in an oncologic patient. I want to ask you now, which is your predicted diagnosis? A, hemangiomas, B, focal nodular hyperplasia, C, FNH-like lesions, D, focal steatosis, E, metastasis, F, cholangiocarcinomas, G, neuroendocrine tumor. I will give you now 20 seconds. Please go to the chat and answer which is your predicted diagnosis. I know it's only based on ultrasound, but we will move forward. And I want to ask you, what would you do? Which is the next step in management? I will give you again 20 seconds to answer any of these. A, would you do a follow-up ultrasound? B, CT? C, MRI? D, PET? Or E, nothing, forget about them. Well, in this case, the patient underwent a CT on the same day, and it was reported as no evidence of focal liver lesions. And I can tell you that I almost agree with this, but here we have different levels. And on pre-contrast images, if we, stress the, if we stress the image, we can see something really slightly hypotenuating on pre-contrast images as indicated by the errors. However, nothing is visible either on arterial phase or on portal venous phase. So at this point, you have multiple lesions on ultrasound, nothing is really visible on CT. What would you do next? I will give you only 15 seconds at this point to answer which is the best option. Follow-up ultrasound, follow-up CT, C, MRI, D, PET, or E, nothing. Again, we can forget about them.
This patient, I know that all of you will have answered correctly, and uh, this patient underwent MRI after 10 days. I will show you first the easy images on arterial phase and portal venous phase. Why? Because this region show nothing. Indeed, post-contrast images for CT and MR are similar because both techniques, uh, both, both contrast agents are extracellular. And so we don't see the lesion either on CT or MRI on post-contrast images. So we, we know that this was the answer, but MRI is a multi-parametric technique. And so we have for MRI other information that we, we can get from other sequences. Indeed, let's look at the out of phase images. As we can see indicated by the arrows, we have signal drop in, the, in this lesion. These lesions are slightly nodular and they, are, they show signal drop on the opposite phase of the dual phase sequences. They are multiple. And I want to ask you now, here and here is the corresponding CT and MRI images for one of the lesions. So we can see it on the opposite phase, but we cannot see it on CT or MRI on post-contrast images. So which is your diagnosis at this point? You have all elements, you have ultrasound, you have CT, you have MRI. Now I want you to answer one of these. I will give you, for, starting from now, 30 seconds. And uh, during the seconds, please go to the chat and answer A, hemangiomas, B, FNH, C, FNH-like lesion, D, focal steatosis, E, metastasis, F, cholangiocarcinoma, or G, neuroendocrine tumor. I know that all of you will have answered correctly. You have all the elements. So again, we have a patient with history of breast carcinoma operated under, who underwent chemotherapy. And this lesion discovered on ultrasound. So uh, very well, I know that most of you will have answered correctly. This is a, these are, lesions known as pseudonodular steatosis. This is focal steatosis. So what we learn from this case is that only 3% of incidental focal liver lesions are malignant in patients with breast carcinoma. So even if we have an oncologic patient, we have to think first, these lesions are benign. We also know that fat infiltration in the liver may occur in 15% of the general population uncommonly also in a nodular pattern. Tamoxifen, which is used for breast cancer, may induce hepatic steatosis. However, I give you some tips for the differential diagnosis between pseudonotural steatosis or any benign lesion and metastasis. For pseudonotural steatosis, we have lack of invasion or displacement of vascular structure. We have an announcement similar to normal liver parenchyma and the lesion stability over time is also useful. And as shown in this case, so the first exam performance was CT, but this was not correct. The first technique should have been MRI because MRI, in addition to the information provided by the, by the extracellular phases, we have also the information provided by other sequences. So MRI should have been preferred in this case. And now let's move to the third and last case for, for my session. And we have for the third case, a 30 year old woman. For the first time, for the first of the three cases, no oncologic patient. This time, no history of surgery, no oncology, nothing related to the oncology for the medical history. And the patient complains of fever and abdominal pain. I will show you here the arterial phase. We can see in the liver that something is going wrong. And I'm sure all of you noted the lesion in segment seven, and you are noticing something also in the rest of the liver. I will show again the arterial phase because it is useful to see it very well.
And I will show you now the port albino space. The lesion is uh, still there. Something else is not visible in the, in the liver. And there is probably something else in other organs. And I selected for you some relevant images on pre-contrast, hepatic arterial phase and port albinous phase. I want you to take five seconds to look at these images and to try to understand what's this lesion. It is hypotenuating on pre-contrast, a strange enhancement on arterial phase, and something is also occurring on portal venous phase. Some, it seems to retain the contrast, yes or no. I want to ask you now, which is your predicted diagnosis for this focal liver lesion? I will give you 30 seconds from now to answer the question, is it an hemangioma? A focal nodular epiplasia, FNH like lesion, D focal steatosis, hepatocellular adenoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, clunch carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumor. I will give you those seconds to answer. Please go to the chat. I want you all of you to answer this question. The patient underwent a six-month follow-up on CT, and here is the lesion. Now I know that all of you will recognize what's this lesion. It is very hypervascular in the hepatic arterial phase, as indicated by the arrow, and this is nearly isotenuating to the liver on portal venous phase. So I know that all of you will have answered correctly, and this is the, the right diagnosis. This is a focal nodular epiplasia. I want you, I know that all of you will have seen something strange occurring in the liver, and that was a mosaic appearance and very common for sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, and a focus of pyelonephritis in the kidney. And these two are related. Indeed, sinusoidal dilatation may be observed in systemic inflammatory disorder in the absence of any venous outflow impairment. The stasis of blood within hepatic sinusoids will give the mosaic appearance, and this mosaic appearance may alter the normal appearance of focal liver lesions, including focal nodular epiplasia. So thanks to this case, you will have learned that 97% of incidental focal liver lesions are benign, because this was a non-serotic and non-oncologic patient. FNH usually shows marked enhancement in the arterial phase and isotenuation to liver parenchyma on portal venous and delayed phase. However, if there is something else occurring in the liver, in this case, this was a case of sinusoidal dilatation, so a sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, the normal contrastic features of FNH may be lost. And these atypical features may regress if the underlying abnormality regresses. Thanks for your attention. So thank you, Federica, for these uh, amazing and very tricky liver cases. And now we are changing a uh, chapter. And I uh, will give the microphone to Karin Ostwis, and she will challenge uh, your expertise on, on bowel cases. Thank you very much, Eric, for your introduction. And thank you, just as Federica said, for um, to Gerbet for inviting us for this online symposium. And good day to all of you who are viewing us today. This is my disclosure slide. Now I would like to move on to the first case. And this concerns a 67 year old female patient who recently had an episode of Melina. Her laboratory results showed an iron deficiency anemia. So for those reasons, a colonoscopy was performed. However, this was incomplete as only the hepatic fracture could be reached. Therefore, a CT colonography was performed after this without intravenous contrast medium administration. And this was done in July, 2019. 
On this slide, I show you two images of the CT colonography. On the left-hand side, you see the coronal image with the white arrow pointing to a polypoid intraluminal mass in a small bowel loop. And on the right image, you can again see the mass located on the right side of the abdomen in a small bowel loop. So we do not have many results yet, but we do have a non-obstructive mass in a small bowel. It was located in an ileum loop. And what could the diagnosis be? I would very much like you to vote right now. You can use the chat for that. Is it A, adenocarcinoma, B, lymphoma, C, neuroendocrine tumor, D, gastrointestinal stroma tumor, or E, metastasis? I will give you some seconds. Thank you very much. Moving on. We didn't know the diagnosis. Maybe you already knew, but we only stated there is a suspicion of malignancy. So therefore, a CT abdomen in the portal venous phase was performed to check for possible metastasis of this suspected malignancy. And on the image in the right upper corner, you see an actual slide um, from September 2019 with a white arrow indicating a irregularly formed mesenteric mass. So what we did then was check whether we had any earlier available examinations. And this patient did. She underwent a CT angiography of the uh, order in May 2019. And this is in the lower right corner, you can see the arterial phase image at about the same level. And you again see the mesenteric mass, and you can very nicely see that it has arterially enhancing components. So we had a tentative diagnosis that we put in a report, and then specific lab results came back after that. And what was the case? This patient had a very much elevated level of chromocranin A in her blood. So we have more results than we just had. What would your diagnosis be at this time based on the results I just gave you? I'll give you some seconds again. So please use the chat and choose either A, B, C, D, or E. And I guess all of you knew this, but this was indeed a neuroendocrine tumor, a net. This was <clears throat> well, a presumptive diagnosis, but the clinician wanted a verification of the diagnosis, so he wanted PA diagnosis. To this end, a double balloon endoscopy was performed. Two routes were necessary. They started with the oral route, but unfortunately, no abnormalities were seen in the trajectory that was inspected. The patient returned for the anal the balloon endoscopy or via the anal route, and then a stenotic trajectory was seen in the ilum after about 1.5 meters, and they couldn't pass it. Up until that point, a normal mucosa was seen. So, what now? We think it's a net. We do not have a PA diagnosis, and we do not know the grade. We do not know how extensive it will be. Do we do nothing? Just call the surgeon, let the patient go to surgery, or are we going to perform nuclear imaging? And then C, you can choose nuclear imaging FDG PET, D, gallium dotatate PET, or E, fluor dopa PET CT. Please vote using the chat. So I don't know which. Um, choice you made, but what we did was a gallium dotatate PET CT. And this worked nicely. You can see on the images that there's intense tracer uptake in both the mesenteric mass, which you see on the upper right hand side, as well as in the bowel mass, the lower image. So 
Based on all the available results, we say this is a gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumor. The patient underwent surgery in February 2020, and a laparoscopic resection was done of the ileal segment and also of the mesenteric metastases. The pathology result showed a T3N2 net. And what I would like to um, state is that gallium dotatate PET is the most sensitive examination for evaluation of possible net. CT has a mean sensitivity of 73% for detection of the primary tumor, 80 and 75% for detection of hepatic and extrahepatic metastasis. MRI works very well with a sensitivity of 95%, but for the detection of hepatic metastasis. And the Dodotoc and Dodotape PET have a better performance than CT for both primary and metastatic disease. And Gallium Dodotoc PET had also a better performance in uh, literature than MRI for detection of primary tumors. I gave you the choice to perform an FTG PET, but this is not a good alternative because it has a low sensitivity if the neuroendocrine tumor is a well-differentiated one. It's because the glucose metabolism in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors is not that high. So you wouldn't have that much uptake. However, fluor dopa PET will be a good alternative. It is less accurate than the gallium PET, but it is more widely available as a tracer. With regard to the neuroendocrine tumor, this is often a solitary mass, which is an arterially enhancing mass, and you can see it in the intestinal tract with mesenteric metastasis. And most often the primary tumors in a small bowel are very small, located more often in the ileum than in the jejunum. But the small size made these primary tumors more difficult to detect than metastatic foci, meaning the mesenteric lymphadenopathy mesenteric mass. The mesenteric mass that you can see can be either due to direct, direct invasion of tumor or nodal metastasis. And in a very large amount of cases, up to 70%, you can see calcifications within the mesenteric mass. This was not the case in our patient. And again, which I already stated, the most sensitive examination is dotatate PET, gallium dotatate PET. With that, I would like to move on to the second case. This was a 36-year-old female patient who had Crohn's disease, for which she underwent an ileocecal resection in 2005. She came to the outpatient's clinic and said, I have episodes of nausea, vomitus, and diarrhea since several months. And she also had pain in her right lower quadrant since about one year. Um, she came with ultrasound results from another hospital and the report stated that, that there was a large amount of free fluid intra-abdominally and also an encapsulated collection in the right lower quadrant. So what we did at our hospital was an MR enterography done in November 2016. And what you can see on the two images I have um, put in is an encapsulated fluid collection as seen on the ultrasound in the right lower quadrant. You can see it on the actual and the coronal image indicated by the white arrow. And also there's indeed a lot of ascites. We also had a CT abdomen available, portal venous face. And this patient had injected, uh, need not injected, but ingested oral contrast medium with a very nice opacification of bowel loops. And because of that, you can see that there is no connection between the bowel, either the small bowel or the colon, and the collection in the right lower quadrant. The bowel loops are opacified and the collection is completely hypodense. Also, we see the ascites that we already saw on the other images, and we see that there are no peritoneal implants. So I would like to ask you whether you already can think of a possible diagnosis. Could it be an active Crohn's disease with an abscess? Could this be a peritoneal inclusion cyst, meaning the encapsulated collection? Could this be a gynecological tumor or <clears throat> another diagnosis? Please vote.
Well, <clears throat> we stated this cannot be an active Crohn's disease. Why not? There's only very mild disease activity in the neoterminal ilium. You see on the post contrast T1 weighted image, um, the, arrow is in, uh, the arrow is indicating the neoterminal ilium that there's hardly more uptake of contrast medium than of the surrounding bowel loops. And on the DWI with the B value of 800 on the right hand side, you see there's only a very slightly, um, slight amount of uh, restricted diffusion. Also, we can see that the flu collection is not an abscess, as the collection does not show restricted diffusion at all, as you can see on the image. And lastly, ascites is a very rare manifestation in mild Crohn's disease and also even in more severe Crohn's disease. So moving on to our next possible diagnosis, can it be a peritoneal inclusion cyst? No. Peritoneal inclusion cysts are fluid-filled mesothelial line cysts of the abdominal pelvic cavity, typically seen in women of reproductive age with prior abdominal surgery, endometriosis, PID or IBD. What you can see on MRI is a cystic mass with serous fluid, meaning low signal on T1, high signal intensity on T2, and then the cystic mass would have thin internal septations. Often, at the center of the cyst, you can see a morphologically normal ovary. And lastly, ascites is not a feature. On the right upper side, I have an image of our patient <clears throat> and two blue arrows indicating two normal ovaries. And they are not at the center of our encapsulated collection. So no peritoneal inclusion cyst. Then gynecological tumor. Normal ovaries, so no. So what was done then in November 2016 was an ultrasound that guided paracentesis and there was mucinous material aspirated. So we get to the other diagnosis or I don't know. Well, actually we didn't know. But the answer is in the oil, old, actually very old files. There was a pathology report from the ileo section in 2005, and they stated that there was terminal ileum and cecum attached, but no appendix. So there we have it. We have a low-grade mucinous neoplasm with pseudomyxoma peritonei from the appendix or rest appendix that was not resected in 2005. Resection was performed in December 2016 and pathology proved indeed the correct diagnosis. And in February 2017, a high back procedure was performed. So pseudomyxoma peritonei is characterized by mucinous societies and peritoneal implants. It's very rare with an estimated incidence of about one to two per million per year. Generally, this originates from a perforated mucinous tumor of the appendix. And typically, it shows slow intraperitoneal growth without distant metastases. The optimal treatment is cytoreductive surgery combined with high back, so hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Moving on to case three. This is a 51-year-old male with a history of gallstones, hypertension, and an SDHD mutation with paraganglioma and prolactinoma. He complained of abdominal pain episodically in the right upper quadrant since about eight months. This patient had a CT abdomen for evaluation of possible pheochromocytoma with his uh, mutation in November 2017. No pheochromocytoma were seen, but the radiologist reported as an additional finding that there was wall thickening of the gallbladder with infiltration of surrounding tissue, as you can see on the actual CT image indicated by the white arrow. Nothing was done with that. And then in April 2018, he presented himself to the emergency department with abdominal pain and clinically uh, an alias. And what we saw 
the CT was performed portal venous phase where dilated jejunal loops, which you can see indicated by the white arrow. And also we could see that there was a mechanical alias with the obstruction being in a well, distal jejunal or proximal island loop indicating by the blue arrowhead. And at this point, there was an intraluminal soft tissue density seen. Just images on this slide. On the left-hand side, for reference, you can see the older CT coronal reconstruction indicating the wall thickening of the gallbladder. And then the new CT with the um, made at the emergency um, situation, where you can see a different image the gallbladder is not distended anymore, indicated by the white arrow. You can see new mobilia, indicated by the blue arrow head, new. And also you can see a small airfield tract between the gallbladder. And so this is on the right, uh, image on the right, which also has air in it and a duodenum. So what could this diagnosis be? Again, I'll give you some seconds to put an answer in the chat. Can it be A, anocarcinoma, cholecystitis, gallstone ileus, both anocarcinoma with then cholecystitis, or E? I don't know. This was a gallstone ileus in April 2018 with a migration of a gallstone into the bowel through a biliary enteric fistula with obstruction of the bowel. This is very rarely seen in 0.3 to 0.5% of patients with gallstones, but it has a rather high mortality rate of 15 to 18%. And then in this patient, that's why I put it in, we have the regular triad. And this was first mentioned by Leo Regler in JAMA 1941. So the regular triad is pre present in only one third of cases with gallstone ileus, where you can see both a small bowel obstruction, pneumobilia, and a obstructing stone in the gastrointestinal tract. So gallstone ileus is a rare cause of bowel obstruction. Obstructing gallstones generally migrate to the bowel via bilioenteric fistulas, this is 85%. 85% um, is a cholecystoduodenal fistula. Gallstone ileus has a high mortality and often a non-specific presentation. So beaver, our patient is still alive, by the way. And lastly, some short take-home messages. Firstly, bowel pathology can be very interesting, I think at least. Use all the information you have to arrive at a differential diagnosis. So old results, lab results, etc. And do not forget to look at very old examinations or old examinations. And with this, I would like to thank you for your time. Okay, so let's move now to the last series of cases entitled uh, miscellaneous disorders. And uh, here are my disclosures. So the first case, uh, it's a 70-year-old, 71-year-old uh, male patient. Uh, he has a history of prostate cancer treated by surgery. He also has a renal disease. And uh, the recent problems are as follows. He complains from a weight loss, minus uh, 8 kilograms over one year. And we also found monoclonal IgM kappa MGUS. And uh, he, for any reason, he underwent a uh, CT scan. This CT scan was found abnormal. So here is a uh, CT. It runs quickly, but you will get after a selection of uh, relevant uh, images. So here are the CT findings in this patient. Uh, so you, uh, I think that uh, all of you have uh, identified uh, the problem. You have uh, two axial views on the left and one uh, coronal view and one digital view on the right. And I also give you something interesting. 
with uh, a set of uh, delayed images and this uh, delayed images, um, I think, to my opinion, are helpful, are helpful to interpret these cities. So um, now you will have uh, questions to answer. And again, you will have to uh, write in the chat box uh, whether you think it's A, B, C, D, or E. So uh, the proposed diagnoses are mesenteric lipomatosis, B, abdominal fat stranding, C, sclerolipomatosis, D, mesenteric paniculitis, and E, peritoneal lymphomatosis. So pay attention to every little details, the devil is in the details. And uh, you have a portal venous phase and delayed phase on the right, just to remind you. And I will give you 10 more seconds. And uh, then I will give you the answer. Okay, I think most of you have the diagnosis. It's a mesenteric paniculitis. Just to show you some examples of the other entities are at the bottom of the slide. On the left, you have a lipomatosis. Lipomatosis is fat surrounding uh, the bowel loops. Uh, fat stranding is completely different. It's a reactive process to an aggression of uh, in the peritoneum, for instance, pancreatitis or diverticulitis, which is not the case here. Sclerolipomatosis is the consequences of uh, Crohn diseases, and uh, uh, of course, it's not the case in that patient. And lymphomatosis is the, for lymphoma, the equivalent of uh, uh, carcinomatosis. Now, uh, just to remind you the five major signs of, of mesenteric paniculitis, which is uh, not very rare. You will, or I think all of you have already encountered this uh, entity. Uh, the first sign is uh, misty mesentery, so you have some kind of blur here. You have a mass effect, you have a displacement of the surrounding structure, you have a pseudocapsule at the periphery, you have uh, the fat sing, uh, fattering sign here uh, with the blinking circle here and around nodules, and these nodules should measure less than 10 millimeter in, in diameter. So what do you recommend for this patient? Should you go to FDG PET, surgical resection, surgical biopsy, image guided biopsy, or do nothing? So A, B, C, D, and E. And again, you give your answer in, in, in the chat box on your right. I give you 15 seconds. Do quickly because it's a quite straightforward case. It's a very frequent situation. Okay, of course, there's no, not a single answer possible because uh, we, as a clinicians, order uh, FDG PET, which does not add much information in this patient because you see that there is no marked uptake at the site of the mesenteric paniculitis, and the uh, uptake is less than that of the liver. You see SUV max at 2.4. And then, what next? Then, because of the weight loss, they put us under the gun and they asked us to do the biopsy, even though we were not in favor of doing the biopsy. But we did the biopsy, and the biopsy yields a diagnosis of adipose tissue with fibrosis. Fibrosis was uh, expectable because uh, we had the delayed announcement of mass, and we just only got uh, gentomized histocyte and lymphoplasmacytic infiltrations, which is typically a lymph, uh, reactive process. We did not get any malignant cell. Just to uh, give you uh, interesting uh, key facts about uh, mesenteric paniculitis, it's frequent. It's uh, between 0.1 and 7% in the literature. I think that 7% is exaggerated. In my experience, it's to 0.5 to 2%, maybe. It's in general asymptomatic. Sometimes it's just accompanied by fever, or weight loss, or vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, it's uh, pathologic, pathologically, it's a fibrotic and inflammatory involvement of the, of the mesenteric fat. It's of, of a mechanism of, of unknown origin. It is important things to know it, that it is not associated to, uh, with malignancies, it's the vast majority of cases. So when to worry? Uh, we have to worry when patients have clinical symptoms, which, which is the case, which was the case here. When you have nodules larger than 10 millimeter in diameter, when we have distant lymph nodes, 
solid organic movement in, in the scientists. And this is just to highlight my, 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 what I'm telling you. This is the cases which is provided to me by my friend Mark Zanz, uh, showing uh, uh, lymph nodes uh, bigger than uh, uh, one centimeter in, in the mesenteria. So what to remind, take a message, this is not a perineoplastic syndrome, so uh, forget malignancy, just keep, keep calm, relax, just follow up your patient in, in most cases, so everything will resolve uh, spontaneously. Uh, let's, next, uh, let's move now to my second case. And uh, we have a young patient this time. It's a 23-year-old patient, a female with overweight problem. And she complained from chronic dysphagia, long-lasting history of food infection, persistent heartburn. And uh, these uh, symptoms did not respond to gastroesophageal reflux disease medication. So here is a chest CT. Again, uh, it uh, goes uh, quickly, but you will get selected images uh, later on on the next slide. So it's a CT acquired with uh, IV contrast and oral contrast. And uh, as I promised, here is a selection, three actual slices and one coronal reconstru reconstruction. I think that uh, all of you have identified the problem uh, 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 in the region of the esophagus. So my question comes now. Uh, what would be your first hypothesis? Do you think it's esophageal lymphoma, uh, esophageal cancer, layer myomatosis, pseudotumor esophagitis, or diffuse esophageal uh, spasm? So A, B, C, D, E, and you can answer in the, in the chat box. It's not very easy, but for those who know this entity, it's, it's very, very uh, straightforward. Okay, so here are the endoscopy findings. And uh, at endoscopy, the gastroenterologist identified uh, a stenosing and esophagitis with pseudofaculosis. And also, he noticed the fragility of the esophageal mucosa with a trend to bleed. And when uh, the gastroenterologist decided to perform a condoscopy, uh, the complication the went and uh, uh, there was a large laceration of the mucosa with a huge bleeding in the esophagus. So, so he has removed the endoscope and, 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 and tried to coagulate uh, uh, the bleeding. So because it's uh, esophagitis, what is the cause to your opinion of this esophagitis? Do you think it's uh, lymphocytic esophagitis, reflux, eosinophilic, drug-induced or infectious? So five proposal, and again, you can vote in your uh, chat box. Lymphocytic reflux, eosinophilic, drug-induced, or infectious. So now let's take a look at the answer. Uh, it was eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, at biopsies, we have used a huge infiltration by eosinophils with multiple microabscesses. Uh, esophageal manometry identified numerous uh, spasms, and when uh, asking the patient, we found that the patient uh, had uh, typically was typically atopic, and we found a cow's milk uh, protein intolerance in childhood. And so the treatment given to this patient was a empiric elimination diet, and we are still uh, doing food tests to identify the potential allergens. The patient was given uh, 15 mg per day of corticosteroids and proton pump inhibitors, and now the patient dramatically improved. And just to uh, remind you that uh, it's a rare, it used to be a rare choreclinic allergic immune condition of the esophagus, uh, but now it's better known and uh, it's identified in more and more patients. So the background, the phys pathophysiology is the accumulation of eosinophils in the inner lining of the esophagus, in which this causes inflammation. Atopy is always found as, as a background with asthma, eczema, rhinitis of food allergy. And uh, remember that these uh, anomalies can mimic tumors or, or leiomyomatosis. And this patient at the very beginning, I just can tell you this now, it was referred to us for a suspicion of leiomyomatosis. 
Uh, of course, the diagnosis was made by endoscopy, and something, an important finding, is that this patient, a very fragile, delicate, and inelastic, crepe paper-like uh, mucosa, so if you push too much the endoscope, there is a, a risk of bleeding and a risk of tear of the esophagus. And uh, in this paper published in, I guess, in, in 2003, uh, some authors propose that this fragility of esophageal mucosa could be a pathognomonic of uh, this uh, entity. So remi uh, remind this entity for those who didn't know it before. And now well, let's move to uh, the last case, case number three. And, uh, and the good news for you is that it's a triple case. You, you don't, uh, we won't finish with a single case, we never finish with triple case. So the first patient is 61 year old with a background of herbitis and pachymeningitis. He has a right urinary obstruction. And which necessitated the gestating. The second patient is a, a young one, uh, seven, uh, 27 year old, with a history of uh, just left renal colic, left urinary obstruction and gestating. And the last one is 65, with weight loss, uh, inflammatory syndrome, he had no urinary obstruction. So with completely different profiles, there is an immune profile for case for patient X normal profile, I would say, for a patient Y, and, uh, and, and cancer profile for patient Z. Now let's take a look at their imaging features. So you see, uh, all of you have, uh, I guess, identified that the problem is not in the peritoneum, but in the retroperitoneum. Uh, more precisely, it's, it's a midline peritoneum, and uh, it's, it's, it's a periartic uh, Problem. So, looking at these uh, CTs, uh, either in actual or coronal uh, planes, do you think uh, um, X is as a malignant disease? Y is a malignant disease? Z is a malignant disease? Or you can see you're very pessimistic. You see all are all have cancer. Uh, or you're very optimistic. You say none have cancer. So uh, you can vote in in in, in the chat box. And uh, so vote A, B, C, D, E. You have uh, 15 seconds. Of course, I will not give you the right answer on the next slides. I will challenge you again, but uh, just to so just a poll. Okay, so I think now you're ready. And first we play our first asset and let's do FDG PET. And just take a look at the FTG uptake, and I've uh, selected uh, some relevant slices, and uh, I indicate you at the bottom of the slides the uh, SUV, SUV Max, 2.5 on the left uh, for patient X, 9 for patient Y, and 6 for patient Z. So here is my question. It's exactly the same question as before. Does it change anything? in your opinion. So A, B, C, D, E, X is malignant, Y is malignant, Z, Z is malignant, all are malignant, or none is malignant. So 15 seconds. OK, just before I give you the right answer, I just tell you some important uh, facts about FDG PET, which is often taken as a problem solver. It, it helps, but it's not always a problem solver. I've selected two papers, one uh, showing you that uh, 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 some authors have proposed to use FDG PET to differentiate between malignant and benign conditions. You see that, if, of course, if you have a very, very low FDG uptake, it's very reassuring. If you have a very uh, high FDG uptake, uh, uh, you can worry. Uh, but you have um, a threshold uh, uh, around six. But as usual with box plot, you have a, a large overlap between the different categories. So it's very difficult to only on the basis of FDG PET to uh, separate uh, malignancy from uh, benign condition. Uh, the second paper on the right here is, I think, is more interesting. They, in these authors, uh, propose in, in retroperitoneal fibrosis because all of you identified that it's a retroperitoneal fibrosis. They 
propose uh, to use FDGPET as a marker of activity. And on the left, you have uh, no uh, active uh, retropinal fibrosis. In the middle, little active, and on, on the right, uh, markedly, uh, markedly active. So, uh, because we turned around the patient and we still uh, don't have the diagnosis, then we, uh, because they have all the same symptoms, all the same, almost the same findings, uh, that we propose the same punishment. So, they, uh, we propose them to be biopsied <laughs> from, uh, if, of course, with a posterior approach. And uh, to your opinion, now it's a more tricky case. Uh, in which patient did we identify IgG4 proliferation at biopsy? Do you think it's patient X, the immune patient? Do you think it's, it's patient Y, the normal patient? Do you think it's patient Z, the cancer patient? Do you think it's, we found it in all patients or none of them? I give you 15 seconds. Again, use the chat box to vote. Okay, so let's move to, sorry, the answer. So in the two first patient, we had only idiopathic retropersonal fibrosis. And of course, I think most of you have identified in the third one that it was uh, uh, inflammatory per, uh, inflammation around the uh, um, abdominal uh, aneurysm. So I know that uh, uh, it's very trendy to evocate the diagnosis of IgG4, and every time we have this kind of findings, the clinician tells us, okay, do a, uh, take a sample and try to identify IgG4. But uh, it's not because it's trendy be that uh, it's always uh, IgG4, which is not that um, uh, frequent. And in the ma vast majority of cases, it's uh, hydropoietic. So just to uh, summarize what is retropinal fibrosis, it's, it's, uh, it's made of fibrous inflammatory tissue surrounding the abdominal aorta and the major arteries. It extends into the retroperitoneum. It's quite rare. Uh, and it, uh, it causes a, a urinary obstruction. The incidence is here, one out of 200,000. Uh, there's a male predominance, and that typically this disease occurs at the age around uh, 50 or 60. Uh, two thirds to three quarters are primary and idiopathic. You see that malignancy is found fine, uh, only in 8% of cases. There is uh, frequently association with immune disorders, but not necessarily with IgG4. Uh, be careful, FDG PET is not always a problem solver. Uh, um, all that glitters is not gold, so for, don't forget this. And the gold standard for this disease is to do the biopsy, and of course, preferably uh, image guided biopsies. Here on the right, you uh, have uh, some. Uh, uh, examples of uh, secondary retropinal fibrosis, but I remind you that the mass majority of cases is a primary and idiopathic uh, disease. And how do we manage this patient? Uh, it, well, it depends. You see uh, on the right, uh, and the association with immune disorder. So it's very frequent. And I have, uh, because this paper is published in 2006, and at this time, IgG4 proliferation was not clearly identified, so I, I add it by myself in, 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 the, in the table. And on the left, uh, it's, it's, it's quite standard. The management is quite standard. However, it's idiopathic. Uh, if you have ureteral involvement, you place g stand. If you don't have, you don't place g stand, of course. Give the patient steroids, and in general, it's, uh, you have a marked improvement of the symptoms. And of course, for all uh, secondary uh, retropinal fibrosis, it is recommended to treat the primary cause and, and, and then also to give steroids and ureteral stenting if necessary. Well, so what was the outcome of our uh, three patients? So the first two patients, I just, uh, just remind you that they have uh, idiopathic retropinal fibrosis, so they've been treated with uh, steroids and uh, ureteral stenting. And for the last patient, of course, is a completely different disease because he has an uh, uh, inflammatory uh, uh, abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm, so he was treated with uh, endoprothesis. 
Well, with that, I've finished my presentation. I would like to uh, thank you again for listening and for participating. I hope you learned some uh, important uh, um, facts about from all uh, Swiss speakers and uh, wish you a, a great day. And thanks, thanks again to, to Gerbe for uh, supporting this, uh, this event. Bye-bye. You can unmute yourself and start with the discussion. And thanks. A lot. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have finished with, finished with the presentation. I propose you can uh, you send all uh, your uh, question using the chat box. And I already get one, which came during uh, Federica's presentation. It was uh, this uh, this question was about uh, case number two. If you remember well, it's a case with. Uh, in the, with a patient with a nodular uh, steatosis. And the question was, uh, why liver-specific contrast agent not used? Okay, so can, can you hear me? So, yep. Thanks, so, first of all, thanks for your question. This is a fantastic question and I completely agree with uh, the person who made the question that uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound may provide uh, important information. Uh, it can show that there is no shout in the early or delayed phases. In this case, the patient uh, uh, who did the ultrasound, um, so the ultrasound was performed in a, here and the person who was not confident with contrast enhanced ultrasound and, was, uh, and the patient directly performed CT on the same day in another center. I completely agree that contrast enhanced ultrasound would have provided important information. However, uh, considering that these are multiple lesions, uh, probably the final diagnosis uh, was only possible with MRI with the dual phase sequences. So also in this case, although uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound that provided important information, not showing any washout in the early and the late <laughs> phase, it wouldn't have allowed the final diagnosis. The, the question was more about liver specific contrast agents in MR. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, okay, sorry. Okay. So in this case, um, this was not specifically necessary in this case. We, uh, for, we felt this these lesions were benign, and uh, uh, in this case, there was no real concern for uh, malignancy because we know that this lesion would have been benign. And so we, we, we thought that there was no need to perform a, a hepatobiliary contrast agent. Uh, if our first hypothesis would have been uh, metastasis, then yes, but as I told you, we do the dual phase sequences and already with the dual phase sequences, we were confident that the diagnosis was benign. Okay, thank you, Federica. I got a question for Karin, and the um, uh, question is, how can a patient undergoing a right hemicolectomy still have an appendix in situ? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your question. <laughs> we were wondering the same, and we actually uh, took um, some time to figure out the diagnosing, you know, at the LAMN, because we thought there could not be an appendix. But it was the colleague of mine, the interventional radiologist, who performed the ultrasound, and who said, hmm, this is really mucinous material. And then he was the one that um, took the time and go through the old... Um, results that the patient had available and then he suggested in his report uh, look at the old pathology report that there was no appendix i have no clue i think they stapled it, it off i have no idea whether you know um i don't want to offend anyone but um, if a resident maybe performed the surgery and <laughs> didn't identify it no clue very good question yeah. When there is a fault, it's not always a resident's fault. Remember this sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know, I <laughs> know. 
Okay, uh, any other questions? I don't get so many questions. There were many, many participants uh, during the vote, but now uh, I hope some uh, attendees are still online. Uh, any other questions for any of the speakers? So, just hesitate. No, we can wait. We, in, we I, I, I was wondering which was the most common answer to the second case. To my yeah. second case. Okay, I have a question from Giuseppe Brancatelli. Okay, so, uh, hi Giuseppe. Uh, the question is, uh, yeah, Eric, you showed some amazing coronal reconstruction. Do you routinely obtain them in your practice in all CT studies or only in, in selected cases? Well, uh, in interpretation, I, I work in a cancer hospital and, and the cancer evaluation is mostly due in the, in the transverse plane, as you know, because versus criteria works in... in uh, 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 Jason Criteria works in, in, in this plane, but every time we have uh, something uh, complicated, it, it's good to have uh, to dispose from reformation, and I like uh, very much doing reformation, and also for the purpose of teaching and uh, and to uh, hide, to convey important message during this kind of presentation, it's good to uh, have uh, reformation. Uh, oh, I have a a question uh, about focal nodular hyperplasia. So it's more a question for Federica. What is the natural history? <coughs> natural history what? of fo fo what is the natural history of focal nodular hyperplasia? Okay, focal nodular hyperplasia normally um, is, is first of all is a first of all thanks for your question. Focal nodular hyperplasia is a, a benign lesion. Uh, normally, it remains stable in size, but it can reduce in size. And but on the other side, uncommonly, it can also in slightly increase in size. However, even if there can be these changes, uh, considering that there is no risk of malignancy for this lesion or any complication, this lesion must be managed safely, so conservatively. Uh, the patient do does not have to do any uh, biopsy. Uh, the patient, can, if the patient is taking any oral contraceptive, she can continue it. So normally uh, these lesions are completely benign and uh, do not require any follow-up. There is no risk for any malignancy. Uh, I, I told you they re usually remain stable or decrease in size. Occasionally they can increase in size, but very, very rarely but this does not mean anything so you can forget so you can tell the patient that she can for, she can forget about it i'm telling she because these lesions are most common in uh, women compared to men but on the other side they can sometimes occur or also in men okay Federica, i have a question for you you say that this kind of lesion do not tend to increase in size over time but we don't get them at birth <laughs> but we don't get sorry get, we don't get them at birth <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so, so. At, 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 does anybody know at what age they, they appear you, you, we don't have so, examples well, in, 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 uh, in newborn we don't have FNH in, in infants and children do we have no so we normally have them in young women so yeah. it's normally in the reproductive age so it's normally yeah. uh, in, around 30 years, but you can also have 15, 35, 40 years. So it's normally in young, in young women. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have uh, FNH-like lesions uh, that simulate FNH in case of vascular disorders like in bad carry or in vascular fontaine, but these are a different set. Uh, concerning FNH is mainly in uh, young women. And you have to differentiate them uh, from uh, hepatocellular adenomas, which instead require follow-up. Okay. Any other question uh, from the chat? No, not even not uh, incoming question. I have a question for, for you, Karin. You showed in the in, in the patient with the net. Yeah, it, it appears that you, you started with a, a CT with positive contrast. Is, is that a standard strategy in your hospital or do you prefer now uh, using MR as first examination? Oh, well, um, so it was the first case, the elder um, female patient. 
in your yeah. adventure. Yeah, what we first did was a CT colonography. And for that, we um, <clears throat> she had um, drank the um, iodine containing uh, contrast medium for pacification of the uh, small bowel. But for standard portal venous phase abdomen, abdominal um, CT, we use uh, water. We do not use okay. um, iodine anymore. Okay, thank you. And MR, what's about MR? As first um, yeah. examination for, um, you mean for, for, for small bowel lesions? Or something like this, yes. Yeah. It really depends on the clinician. In this case, this was the um, older female patient with the iron deficiency anemia. So they thought, well, we, we're probably going to find a colonic lesion. Mm -hmm. but if the suspicion is that there is a um, tumor in a small bowel, um, then we would do an, an MR. And then um, in our hospital, we then would like to do an enterocolysis. So not an MR enterography, but really uh, give them a, um, a well, enterocolysis examination. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question for Federica again, and, and again about focal medullary hyperplasia. Uh, it, a question about the, the location of if the lesion is subcapsular and if it causes pain, do you recommend uh, a surgery? Uh, first of all, um, thanks for the question. Uh, well, if the lesion is subcapsular or if the lesion is inside the liver, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I wonder if the, if the cause, uh, I would firstly uh, try to understand if the cause of abdominal pain is really FNH, because FNH is usually, uh, th does not give any symptoms uh, unless it is very big in size. Uh, so I would uh, avoid to think uh, to surgery as first option in this, uh, uh, in this kind of patients. Uh, then I would try to find another cause of pain in these patients. I, I know this is a great question. Uh, surely if the, the lesion is big in size and it's causing compression, uh, like there have been some cases of compression due to focal nodular epiplasia, uh, to uh, an occlusion of the gastric, uh, so in the GI. So in those cases, I would consider eventually uh, this uh, this possibility, but otherwise I would uh, try to find other causes of abdominal pain. Okay, and I have another question. This time is for Karin again uh, uh, from Stuart Taylor. Uh, would you recommend drainage of uh, inclusion cyst in patients with vague pelvic symptoms? Oh, that's a, hard <laughs> one. a really hard one. Yeah, I saw that it that it is done sometimes. Um, but I have not read whether that in, in those cases that there was a resolution of symptoms. I think it's, hmm. you would have, I think you would have to take into the regard the whole clinical situation, just as you would with um, patients with um, gallstones. And then it's, oh, I have so much complaints and you remove the gallbladder and they still have complaints. So, you know, I'm I'm not sure whether you would always have a resolution of your symptoms if you would drain it with vague abdominal symptoms. I I do think you would have to counsel the patients very well. Yes, I I, I do agree with you. I, I would do the drainage as a test, but uh, just once. And uh, and uh, I guess Stuart is, is, is apologizing because it's it's, it's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I would I would do it as a test, but uh, some, sometimes it might it may improve the patient, sometimes not. Yeah. Okay, I love I, I love international radiologists. I would do I do do drainage as a test. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Any other question? I think we have uh, one or two minutes left. I do have a question for Karin. Ah, okay, Vasi. Okay, go for the okay. Yeah. So, Karin, uh, in the case of suspicion of carcinoid tumor, do yeah. you think that uh, it would have been better to start with PET instead of the double endoscopy? So, in uh, how many cases normally you perform PET uh, before double endoscopy? Good question. Um, the clinician wanted, uh, in our hospital, we do have uh, the double balloon 
endoscopy. So I think the the, the way to go there is easier than if you would, you know, go, um, live in another part of um, our um, of our country. Um, so because it's quite readily available, they chose this option. But I think otherwise, because there was already the suspicion of a neuroendocrine tumor, they would have done the gallium PET and, you know, be done with it. Very good question. Thank you. Okay, no, thank, uh, thank you, Karin. Thank you, Federica. Now, I think it's time to end the session because we are right on time. Uh, again, thanks a lot to Gerbe for supporting this event. Thanks a lot to the SGAR organization for uh, making this possible. And 